if you do any prospecting with LinkedIn, you have got to go get set up with Surf. That's S U R F E. It's a tool you can use to add new contacts to your CRM system directly from LinkedIn in seconds. I'm using it every single day. I add contacts, follow my deals, keep track of notes, and it ends up saving me a bunch of time on prospecting and outreach, which means I can spend more time moving my deals along. The data is always 100% accurate since I don't have to copy and paste all the fields over from each and every contact that I want to put in my CRM. Instead, Surf does that all automatically with just one click in about 60 seconds. The team over at Surf has put together a very special offer for fans of sales players. There's a link down in the show notes and you can use the promo code JWSURF5. Don't forget the E at the end of Surf. That's JWSURF5 for 5% off your first year. Don't spend another minute doing things manually. Go get set up with Surf. This episode is sponsored by Apollo, a tool that's helping me to open doors and close deals faster. Wanted to share it with you. Apollo is a complete end-to-end sales platform, letting you email, dial, connect on social, build plays, and schedule meetings. With conversational intelligence, transcribing my calls lately, and reminding me to act on my next steps to drive deals across the finish line, it's been a lifesaver. It's no wonder Apollo is the most loved sales tool on the planet. Thousands of users rank Apollo as a top tool on G2. Start today completely free and see how Jesse and I use Apollo. Sign up in the show notes below or at thesalesplayers.com forward slash Apollo. That's thesalesplayers.com forward slash A-P-O-L-L-O to start your free trial. All right, everybody, we are here today live with Barry Klein. And Barry, let's get right into it. So I was looking at your LinkedIn profile and I hit expand there. And it looks like you have some dot com pre 2000 sales training. And it's you went from a company that how how small were they when you started and then how rapidly did they grow? We I was employee 73 and we grew to 2300. Okay. Uh, and and then when the dot com bubble burst, we laid off and reduced staff back, you know, well into wow. the, the low thousands and below. And uh and it it was a great run for me. So I, I left when I still felt really good about what we had accomplished. <laughs> and what was your role when you first started? Um when I first joined the company, um back in the late nineties, I was uh, basically a sales engineer. Okay. Uh, working the East Coast. Um, it was the dot-com boom. Uh, we were selling a content management uh, solution that uh, really was being adopted by both the dot-com startups of the day, but also because if, if you go back, and by the way, I'm much, I'm much older than I look, so that's the problem because I'm, <laughs> I'm in my upper 50s, which surprises most people, but I was there you know, yeah. telling stories like grandpa. I was there when the Wall Street Journal was thinking about their online presence and wow. uh, Chase Bank was thinking about their online presence. I was, I was in the room where it was happening, Holy um, cow. Which, was, which was remarkable. Um, and we were selling to both the dot-com startups as well as to established enterprises. Mm-hmm. Um, I was naive enough to think that when the dot-coms started to blow up, that we would still be okay with our enterprise business. But what happened was as the dot-coms blew up, the enterprises were under far less pressure, right? Mm-hmm. They Because even back in the late 90s, no one wanted to be Amazon, right? But once, uh, you know, the who was the talking dog Pet, not Petco, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I know the story. It's like it's, pets. It, was it pets.com. Right? Yeah, pets.com. Pets.com. Yeah. Once that stopped happening, you know, if you were a brick and mortar, you know, pet supply store, you were a little less worried. So everything dried up. It, it was, uh, it was quite a run from trough to peak and back to trough. Hmm. And then, oh, but by the way, so I was yeah, I was sale, a sales engineer on the East Coast. Became uh, the manager of the East Coast sales engineering team, and then moved to Austin, Texas famed in song and story uh, on this podcast um, to uh, run the North American sales engineering team. So we grew my team at one point with both sales engineers and other support staff, including competitive analysis, things like that. We were up over 200 people um, on our team and just grew like a weed. Um, It was a, it was a fun ride, exhausting 
and certainly a young man's game. <laughs> and, and what at that time were your go-to playbooks or books that you were having your reps read? Uh, mm. What were or, or some of the thought leadership that you all yeah. were listening to at that time? It's funny. I was uh, in preparation for today. I was thinking back on those days because, of course, your audience is uh, SaaS focused. Um, wow. And while I'm still involved with enterprise class sales today in a SaaS like way, uh, those that heyday of 25 years ago um, really did shape me. At the time, I would say that I wasn't really even as much of a student of sales engineering customer success that I am now um, because we were doing it by the seat of our pants and we were building something that we, uh, as our one of our founders said, we were all too young and stupid to know that we shouldn't have been doing what we were doing, right? So you just went forth. But there were a lot of lessons that came out of it that I was thinking about that I hope would be helpful for your audience. And, um, you know, a lot, Jesse, I was listening to your uh, three-part series on closing, you know, ah. larger deals. Yeah. And, you know, one of the themes that you were hitting on was, uh, you know, when you're an enterprise class salesperson, more than anything, you're the, you're the orchestra director. Mm -hmm. Um, if you think you know everything, you're going to fail. And if you don't know how to bring your team together, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. But yeah. part of one of the key lessons that I learned was even though you are the, the orchestra director to the orchestra, the director is respected beyond belief. Mm -hmm. Right by being the generalist that he or she is, um, by having a history, by by having earned their stripes, and one of the frustrating things, especially in the go go growth period, was working with account executives who, for lack of a better term, my team would call the donut bringers. You know, hi everyone, we're here, and here's the sales engineer to tell you what's going to happen. Oh, and on the man. one hand, it's very flattering. Uh, on the other hand, the sales engineers think, last time I checked, I'm not being paid as much as you. <laughs> and, you know, could you could you add some value to this yeah. process? Um, and that notion that I don't have to know anything, I'm just the salesperson. Uh, it's, yeah. I found it all too pervasive. Um, you guys rail against it. And, you know, you, you want people who are credible and grounded in their vertical, grounded in their technology. Um, and hopefully can walk the walk and knowing where to hand off to the subject matter expert, right? Yeah. Um, have some credibility. And then the flip side, you know, one of the, so I, I had an outstanding team and even all these years later, I have members still read former members, former colleagues reach out to me uh, and say, boy, that was the best team I ever worked with. We were, it, it, of course it was fun when times were good. Um, and so I had a team of people who could command an audience who right. could both meet with frontline technical people as well as C-level executives. Mm -hmm. But I wanted the account executive to run the show. I wanted them to. We, it's a yeah. better sale. It's a better experience. On the flip side, I would have sales engineers who sometimes would get a little full of themselves because they were being put on stage. Yeah. Um, but the other key lesson that I would often talk about with my team was, uh, and I, my old colleague, Eric Josowitz, I credit with this, which is the hole in the sock problem. You know, a typical sales engineer, if not properly coached by the account executive, will mm -hmm. say everything. They want you to know everything. I'm your tech guy. I'm your friend. I'm your buddy. I'm the one who's going to make sure that you know exactly what we do. <laughs> and oh, by the way, I have a hole in my sock. It doesn't matter that I have a hole in my sock. It doesn't, th that hole in my sock is not going to change this presentation in any way, shape or form, but I feel obligated to tell you about to, to the share. hole in my sock. And it's, you know, yeah. and it, we would say, don't talk about the hole in your sock. <laughs> Every software has problems. Every piece of software has bugs. <laughs> but can we please yeah. stay focused on solving the problem at hand? So, you know, I, I enjoy both sides of the equation. I enjoy both sets of personalities. And really, you know, the magic happens when you mesh all of that together. So, so back in the dot com days, what, what was it? I, I know it had to have been different to be a sales engineer in early 2000s because, at that time, there really wasn't like this single tenant or multi-tenant SaaS model, I should say. Mm -hmm. At the time, it would have been what, an on-premise type solution yeah, or? Is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that, that blows my mind. I've actually talked to some of my more senior colleagues over the course of my career and, and Thanks, heard Jesse. about I how appreciate you- appreciate <laughs> that. Old, older colleagues. Yes. <laughs> my older colleagues in my career have shared how, you know, if you were selling software or you were selling tech anyway, in the early 2000s, a lot of times that that involved like an on-premise employment. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of visiting people on site and it yes. was, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars in some cases because yes. of the lift that would go into going on site to an enterprise and rolling out 
actual people that were there. Whereas now we live in this world where someone could, I don't know, someone, someone overseas could design a SaaS product that could outsell a lot of the products on the market today. And it's a Chrome plugin, right? Yes. So tell us about, you know, I guess, what was it like back in that, in those times to be a sales engineer, to be meeting with people in person more, and maybe some of the learnings uh, that could help our, our listeners who are back out on the road this year, because I mm-hmm. think a lot of us are rushing back out to events and trying to do more on sites. Yeah. Maybe there's some lessons we can learn from those experiences working in person. Uh, I appreciate the, the, the take on it. I hadn't really thought of it that way. And what, uh, as, as we chat, I always tend to go with the first thing that pops to mind. Um, and the first thing that pops to mind in that case, Jesse, is the most valuable meetings in person generally happen in the bathroom. <laughs> you know, you'll spend hours at a table and then everyone breaks to go to the bathroom. And, you know, I say this horribly because it's it's only the men in the men's bathroom. And so these days, uh, yeah. you know, thankfully, with more uh, women executives and women in leadership, maybe it's not as good a rule. But, you know, you'd head to the restroom and that's where you know, you you chatted for a few minutes. You know, that's where someone would roll their eyes and say, oh, you guys got to stop listening to so-and-so in the corner. He's going to derail this whole thing, you know, or whatever insider coaching information uh, they would provide. And to me, that's still a valuable lesson, not necessarily in the bathroom, but um, which has all other kinds of disgusting kind of things. <laughs> but the, um, my, my boss at Talru right, uh, right now, he and I uh, spent uh, a week in November and a week in December traveling to New York and to Chicago. And we took Mm -hmm. customers out to dinner Mm -hmm. and it was such a pleasure. You know, we were well prepared, but there were no PowerPoints enough with the PowerPoint. Um, We were able to express what we knew about their business. They could feel free to talk about reality. You know, as a person in charge of the customer success team, I want to know your real thoughts. That happens a lot better informally than it does around a tabletop when you're doing yeah. a formal business review or something like that. Um, so I think those rules really still apply. Um, there's no substitute for being well prepared. There's no, I, I will tell you back in the day, especially from a demo standpoint, although it still applies probably today, one of my axioms was the probability of a demo failing is directly related to the number and import of the people in the room, right? They bring in the CEO, especially, you know, we would carry laptops. Right. We'd carry our laptop and we'd fire it up and that's how we were going to demo. That thing was going to yeah. fail. That was going to fail yeah. if the CEO was sitting in the room for the demo. So that's, Murphy, that's Murphy's a, law or something. Yes. Yeah. And, and even today, you look at Zoom calls and other things. The, the hardest part of so much of what we do is often the presentation. So make the presentation solid so it's you know like an umpire in a baseball game. You shouldn't notice it, uh, yeah. but it, it can get in the way. And thinking through every detail, um, the other thing that I'll often say is, I don't want to be asked any question that I don't already know the answer to. Hmm. Um, nor do I want to ask a question that I don't already know the answer to. If we're preparing for an on-site meeting, I want enough preparation that when the questions start coming, I'm like, yeah, I knew you were going to ask that. I knew you yeah. were going to ask that. I knew you were going to ask that. Because then I know I know my customer I, or my prospect at the time. I know my prospect and I know that I can address their needs. Yeah. So really quick, just going back to the, to the bathroom comment, uh, I'm officially part of the club that has closed a five figure annual deal because the CTO of the company I was working with who had not been returning my calls was next to me at the urinal in the bathroom. (laughs) And I don't even remember how we started talking. It was probably once we got to the sink, uh, washing hands and stuff. And then it was like, (laughs) and and then he made the like kind of name face connection in the bathroom, Mm -hmm. which is crazy. And to your point earlier, also I'm glad there's more women executives now because it gives more of these at bats in the restroom at a conference or something like that. And I, I swear to God, within three weeks of that interaction, we had a signed order form for five figures with that company. And he was the bottleneck. He, his team wanted it. I just had not had a chance to connect with him. We were at, actually in Austin, we were at a Christmas party for uh, the investors behind the company I was working for at the time. His company was also in the portfolio. And so he was there also. I didn't necessarily plan to, you know, corner them in the restroom, but it just worked out that way. And, you know, five figures later, they were a customer, which is, uh, I I had never thought about that. I've obviously never shared that on the air here, but (laughs) it's a really interesting insight about, you know, interacting people selling to people, right? Yes, it is. And that's exactly what I was going to say as well. Um, Whether it's 20 years ago with on-site IT professionals and all the challenges they would have or today, 
um, we are fundamentally in the people business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, I've, I've had colleagues say, well, people buy from people who they like, I would tend to say from people who they trust. Right. And that goes back to your credibility. That goes back to, um, as a salesperson, your own personal credibility, the credibility of your team, um, the ethical manner or lack thereof in which you pursue the opportunity. Um, if I don't trust you, why would I do business with you? Yeah. And if I don't trust, and, and if, and if you're a jerk, even if you have the best product in the world, I'm not, I don't know, I'm not going to do business with you. So Barry, fast forwarding through your extensive resume, looks like you were an entrepreneur that you had yes. multiple businesses. Um, and then you're at the current company that you're the current role that you're in today. So yes. would love to highlight more of what was the business that you had, mm-hmm. uh, that you were the founder of and mm-hmm. talk about the role that you're in today. Sure. Um, it, it's been an interesting journey and, uh, maybe it's like Indiana Jones. It's not the years, it's the mileage. Um, but after I left, uh, the dot-com space, um, it had been a good run. We had gone public, um, and, I had an opportunity to pursue a lifelong dream with my best friend where we started a health club. We actually started it while I was still working, um, but then we wanted to grow the business uh, and take it in different directions. We started with a little neighborhood club, but a little neighborhood club wasn't particularly what I was in it for. Um, We weren't looking to build the next great health club chain. I just sort of wanted to build something that would give us a nice lifestyle and pay my health insurance. Um, we took one club and we expanded it from 8,000 square feet to 19,000 square feet, adding a pool. We opened a second facility and we opened two corporate facilities. The problem was all that came together in 2008, right into the teeth of the Great Recession. Oh, man. Um, and said plainly and long story short, we never recovered. And so by uh, 2015, 2016, to say it plainly, I don't mind saying it this way to your listeners. I needed a job. Yeah. Um, and I was in the Northeast, made my way back to Austin, which is where my network was. Um, was very grateful to be hired by what was then Jobs to Careers. Um, and candidly, I started just as a salesperson uh, in the agency team. Um, it's been a very flattering seven years because it was nice when I met with our, our then CEO and founder, uh, who's now uh, in the role of chairman. But I enjoyed meeting him uh, and really getting to know him one day. And I often tell the story where he liked to do one-on-ones with everybody. And he's looking at my LinkedIn profile and he's looking at me and he's looking at my LinkedIn profile and he's looking at me and he says, what do you do for me? And I said, I'm in agency sales. He says, why? (laughs) So um, that was nice to be acknowledged. Then he looked at me and he said, how old are you? And I said, I said, I just turned 50. He said, I thought you were younger than me. And he was in his 40s. So it was a very good conversation. Um, But it was very nice to then be given additional responsibilities uh, for our alliances and then running our job board team, learning the business. I was new to talent acquisition, so it was a lot to learn. Um, But, you know, the lessons of everything from the dot-com days through my entrepreneurial years to now uh, back working in software. Uh, to, it was always interesting. My, my business partner slash best friend, he loved to hear the stories from my nine to five job because so much of it applied and mm-hmm. vice versa. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my, my attitude towards customers was really shaped. Anyone who's worked with the public uh, in retail or something like that certainly learns a lot. Um, and my mantra became, the customer is not always right. The customer is usually wrong or selfish or short-sighted. Um, but the customer's perception has to be acknowledged, not agreed upon. Mm-hmm. I have to acknowledge it. I hear where you're coming from. Mm-hmm. Then I can decide how I want to react. I had one fellow when we were when I was uh, owning the business. Um, he had done something on his monthly payment that was absolutely his fault. And he knew it, but he wanted me to fix it. And I'll never forget the conversation. He said, well, you own the business. You can fix this for me. I said, yes, I can, but I won't because I have to look in the mirror every day and know that I'm treating all my customers the same. How do I do that for you when we did nothing wrong? And, you know, those kinds of lessons stay with you, even when you're dealing with enterprise class software, um, because, you know, for instance, even these days doing the job advertising that we do, the number of times that I have given refunds 
to customers for things that we didn't do wrong. But someone has to move, you know, and so I, I could moan and groan about a few thousand dollars, but will that make you feel better? And then we just document it and we say this is a one-time courtesy and, you yeah. know, et cetera, et cetera. But um, trying to keep your eye on the on the larger prize while treating people fairly and providing a great customer experience, a great sales experience, a great ongoing lifetime experience, um, you know, it, it, there's going to be little bumps along the way. So keeping your eye on the prize for the big picture, but not selling your soul and, mm-hmm. um, you know, trying to treat people consistently. I, I kind of rambled there. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I love that. You know, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a recovering entrepreneur turned SaaS sales executive <laughs> too. So, uh, and I'm grateful that I've landed in this career uh, mm-hmm. to where I, I owned a juice bar and smoothie bar. So yeah, very that, similar yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. to the health club uh, atmosphere. And it's amazing how even a, you know, $15 smoothie or $10 smoothie, somebody can get really upset and you have to use the, you know, they, it could be their fault that they dropped it, uh, yes. but they still want you to pay for it. You know, they want you to pay for it. The um, one of the lessons we would often share with our staff at the health club was uh, we had, we, we expanded our babysitting area. It was quite large, but uh, you, you can run out of room. And you have to say to some parents, I'm sorry, we can't accommodate your children. And like the dropped smoothie, they could freak out right in the lobby and screaming and yelling. What we had to say to the staff was, you have to remain calm because it's never about babysitting. They're yelling at you because of whatever fight they had with their spouse that morning or whatever life issues, everyone's got stuff going on, you know, Mm -hmm. and they need to let the anger out and you are a convenient person upon whom they can do that. Um, And those kinds of lessons, they, they stay with you. And even today at Dal Ru, I'll quote, it's never about the babysitting. (laughs) And then I have to explain what I'm talking about to my team. Uh, But it's, it's never about the babysitting. It's something else. Let's, it's a little uh, bit easier over Zoom, I have to say. It's just <laughs> yeah, a little bit yeah. easier than in person. Maybe I'm just soft, but it's like, I don't know. Zoom, I'm like, you can yell at me all you want, and uh, it's fine. I'll, I'll it doesn't. Ha- I don't think it happens yeah. as often over Zoom, but I used to work as a bank teller early in my career, oh. and that was always the worst. When, you're, when people's money is out of place and you're in a branch, you're just so vulnerable because you can't go hide. You're behind a desk and they'll get, you know, they're going to come scream in your face. <laughs> it's the worst. Um, I was going to say, say real quick. So want to share some, or want to get into some, some tactical ideas for our listeners who for the most part are out there selling a lot of them selling to enterprise working on trying to close deals in 2024 or set more meetings, build more pipeline. And you had mentioned something really interesting in our briefing of the episode, which was so much of the sale, especially the larger the deal size, the more this is true, is all about internal, managing your internal resources, dealing with internal politics, understanding who your players are that can help you move that deal along. Maybe you could share a few examples of how you've deployed that at Talru and and in other companies you've been at and some some things that, that maybe our listeners can take away from today's uh, today's episode and, and apply to their own book of business. Yeah, certainly. Um, as as you phrase that, Jesse, I think you know the the art of persuasion has to flow both ways. Um, account executives can often get annoyed or overly aggressive with their support staff, um, and what I have to remind. AEs about is treat your support staff, very often my staff, like your prospects. You wouldn't treat your prospect with the craziness that I'm seeing. Why are you treating someone you need? You know, that mm. you get more flies with honey, as they say. Right. Um, and similarly, for my team, supporting the customers and, and supporting the, the salespeople who are out there um, doing a job that I, A, I always remind the service and success staff you're not doing that because you've chosen not to. You don't think it's hard? Go wear those shoes for a while. And yeah. therefore, treat the account executive, your counterpart, as your customer. They are they are another flavor of customer. Um, I will say this with the cynicism that comes with marriage and divorce, but you know, for a, a stereotypical 
married couple might say, well, you know, my spouse isn't nice to me anymore. They're not polite. And a, a stereotypical story is you're yelling and screaming at each other. Then the phone rings and the spouse picks up the phone and is like, oh, hi, how are you? All right. You can be nice and polite to that person. And you, you're on your best behavior and you choose your words carefully. You're going to treat me like a piece of garbage because we're married. I mean, I don't want to turn this into a therapy session, but we do have <laughs> our microphones. Good. We could do that. Okay. But, yeah, that's but good. It's, yeah. You know, I got to let it out. But um, yeah. But it really is true. Treating your people as your best asset um, is, I still think, an overlooked uh, important yeah. step. Recently, I've been really trying to emphasize with some of uh, my AE counterparts back to the notion of being the choir director. Don't go it alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, heavens. No. And if you get and the problem is, if you get a detail wrong, you just made my life miserable. You say that we don't have a fee, that we have a feature that we don't, you just made my life miserable. And you didn't do it maliciously, but you didn't, but you know, that's not, that's not your area of expertise. There's nothing yeah. wrong. If any, my, my CEO always credits me with this statement and I guess I'm easy for me to admit because I'm happy to admit what I don't know. Um, he quotes me to this day. I don't know, but I'll go find out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Most powerful, powerful line ever. I don't know. But I'll go, you're going to yell at me for not knowing? I don't know. I'm, I'd rather give you the right answer, I, and but I will go find out. Uh, they say that's the word back. Those are the hardest few words that sellers have to say, but it's also some of the most important. It's the most important thing you can say when you're working, especially, especially with enterprise logos, because there's so much nuance and they will, you know, they'll hold you to, to what you say because, and nowadays everything's recorded so they can go back and listen to the recording and say, Hey, you said that you have that feature. You said that you could solve that problem for us. Now you're telling us you can't yes. or you're not going to deliver that. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a really great point. Yeah. And depending on where it comes up in the sales cycle, you could close the deal and have a very unhappy customer and none of us want churn. Um, it could disrupt your deal when they find out later on in another meeting that what they were told wasn't true. And then they, then it's like, uh, excuse me, that's not what you told me two weeks ago. And then you're, um, 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 trying to fix it. Um, so, you know, that for me, a lot of it goes back to the basic blocking and tackling of your credibility, um, the teamwork, treating people as you would like to be treated and, and that credibility. Um, I was having dinner with one of, uh, we took a prospect to dinner just last week and uh, the account executive who I was with um, is doing a terrific job. He's, he's learned so much um, and he, our product is not easy to understand. 80% of what he says is correct. 10% is wrong enough that I, but not is wrong, but not wrong enough for me to get in a twist. And then the other 10%, I have to politely interrupt and say, oh, that's a great point. But let me put some color on that, you know, and, and fix it. Um, and, and the, and we have a couple of folks, we're, so, we're starting to do more travel. And as a small company, we don't have a sales engineering team. Uh, my customer success team and myself step in, in that role, but it's oh, funny. We're having this conversation because, uh, I've wanted the sales engineering role and, uh, but we haven't really needed it. But what's, what's exciting for us is that in our, our plan for 2024 and our prospects, we are selling to an ICP that is a higher level customer. That is a more enterprise class customer. Um, and so literally two hours ago, I was having discussions about how do we reorganize around that? You know, I probably only need one or two people, but then also creating the culture where my, our BDRs and our AEs know you, I mean, we've always been there to help, but Mm -hmm. I think sometimes people think I don't want to bother somebody or I don't know them well enough. We live in a virtual world. I don't really have relationships. And so really get the relationships built where if you have any question whatsoever, pick up the phone. You want us on on your call? You want us on your call with your product? We're we're there. Let's go. And, And we've always been like that. But as the team has grown and evolved and everyone's been through ups and downs of 2022 and 2023, I'm really hoping to solidify that kind of relationship so that you have a strong sales engineering presence to set you up for success so that then we onboard you and that's consistent with what you heard in the sales cycle. And then your actual experience using our solution is consistent with, you know, all the smoke we blew at you. That, you know, it's real that it's not smoke and mirrors and that we're living up to our expectations. So was that intentional to design customer success as sort of the pre-sales also? Because I've heard that's a strategy some other companies have used. And the reason for that is when it's the same person that's going to ultimately onboard and, and serve that customer long-term, having them involved in the front-end sales process just creates that like consistency across their 
their customer journey. Was that an intentional thing or is that just sort of how, or is it more of a resource constraint thing? Um, it was intentional on my part once I assumed the role that I'm in four years ago because I'm passionate about it. So it was yeah. going to happen whether we had the organization or not. And um, I put myself out there and, you know, I, I've, I would say to our sales leadership, especially a few years ago when we were hiring people who didn't have the experience that our current team has built up over time. So you're dealing with inexperienced people. And I would always say that it sounds much more arrogant than I mean it. But if you're trying to do an, to do an enterprise class deal and you're not talking to Barry, you don't have a deal mm. because there's no way you're going to have the right kind of influence and get the deal closed or have it stick at least. You might close it, but it ain't going to stick unless you're yeah. talking to the people who want to talk to their equivalent title. So yes, guilty as charged. I have a vice president's title. So bring me in to meet my peers. Um, and I have a colleague who often will uh, quote, power buys from power. So bring mm -hmm. me in. But I also have the advantage of, I'd like to think knowing what I'm talking about. And so I can kill two birds with one stone. And the team that we've built, because they are excellent customer facing success people, for some of them, the idea of being closer to sales is very interesting for their careers. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge, uh, Jesse, the way you were describing it, and it is happening more and more often, is that if not done carefully, the customer success person who has that good service heart, they can often flop in the sales cycle mm. because of the overt honesty. I need to tell you everything right now. And sometimes you got to take people on a little journey with you. You know, you got to be a little bit sophisticated. What, what was the sock? Uh, yeah, the hole in the sock. The hole in the sock, <laughs> right. If you have someone in a pre-sales role who feels obligated because of who they are, their morals require them to tell everyone about all the holes in their socks. It's just not the right person. Um, yeah. But Barry, you saying that, I mean, it just makes me uh, think of this time of where our, our sales engineer came into a call and is looking at my prospects website and is just like, well, I don't know if uh, your website's really not that good. And I don't know if our product is good. Enough. It's good. And I'm like, just don't be that honest, man. I'm like, just <laughs> let's get them to sign it and then get everything going. <laughs> Yeah. Or at least if we're going to reach that conclusion, let's do it after some thorough analysis and yeah, discovery just right and off a the... mutual meeting of the mind. You suck is generally not a good sales process. <laughs> yeah. So, sometimes the, the brutal honesty really can play in your favor depending on how honest it is. But yeah, you, there's a there's definitely a breaking break, you know, diminishing return on it sometimes. Yes. That's so and, interesting. And if I may, Jesse, I'll follow that point. You know, in, in yeah. my role is often being in sales calls these days. Um, and Talru's product is, you know, online job advertising. Uh, it's a talent matching platform. And like Google and others, you know, bids become a big part of your life. What is your content bidding? Because you have to win the auction for who gets shown what. And it happens for job search as well as, of course, consumer ads. And we will speak with customers who really want to talk about the cost per click. What's my cost mm. per click going to be? And what we try to focus on is, well, what's actually in our world doing talent acquisition, what application price are you re striving to achieve, right? Who cares what the clicks are? As long as when I divide the cost of those clicks by the number of applications, I get the right cost per application that you're interested in. I can't be too expensive. I, you know, I, so I, I want to know what's your cost per application and how do we, we meet that? And then I'll have prospects argue with me. Yeah. I, oh, but the cost per click on Indeed is this and on ZipRecruiter is that. And then I try to say nice things like every ecosystem is different. So you're comparing apples to apples. With one prospect, and again, I had the credibility from my title and my experience, and I was comfortable in my skin. At one point, I said, I'm sorry, I have to ask, why do you care? You know, And that's an aggressive thing to say to a prospect. But I made a decision in the moment that I have to get in this person's face a little bit. Yeah, because he's not going to let it go. And I needed an answer to why do you care? Uh, because he wanted to control them. Why would I let you control the cost per click? Who knows our ecosystem better than we do? And and our system knows and a lot of it's automated. Uh, most of it's automated. So yeah, there are times when you have to ratchet up the tough love. Um, but not, you know, hey, I look at your website and you suck. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to go back to, this, this is something that I think is going to help a lot of listeners because if, if they're like me, 
they are tied to a, I shouldn't say tied. That sounds negative. They, they are, they have the f- great fortune of being able to work with a sales engineer. Mm-hmm. And I've worked with some really great ones over the course of my career. But what are some, what are some ways that an AE tomorrow could start to prepare their, you know, prepare their solutions counterpart for their next demo demo and avoid the whole, what was it? The donut bringer, the donut bringer. Uh, yes. The donut. Uh, how, yeah. What are some ways that they can make sure they're avoiding the donut bringer persona, but also, you know, working well and building a really strong and, and solid partnership with their solutions counterpart. A few things come to mind. Um, and by the way, thank you for mentioning that because the, a solutions engineer t- title is generally far f- favorable than sales uh, engineer. Yeah. Uh, it either works, but yes, certainly the solutions engineer title uh, resonates a little better. Yeah. Um, the first thing I would suggest of any account executive, especially as they're perhaps young and starting their career, is really embrace the responsibility that you have to be a credible professional. Your your ability to sell is not what you've is not all that you've been hired for. If you're not grounded in your vertical, if you're not grounded in your software, um, you are going to be viewed as an imposter. And if you are an imposter, you will be diminished in the eyes of your sales engineer. I am a big believer that so that once someone accepts that, you know what, I got to learn. I My credibility requires this. My career requires this. It's the right thing to do. I'm going to be more of an expert in my product. Yeah. Your sales, your solutions engineer is your best friend. And when you work with the best, the best SEs are happiest. Their favorite thing to do is to coach an account executive. Mm. Thank you for asking me. Let's talk about that. Let's delve into that. What questions do you have? How can I explain it? Mm. Um, And because the traditional AE is not a technologist by training, it's a great exercise for the SE because one of the skills you have to have is, can I, and it's one of the things I enjoy most is, can I explain technical topics to non-technical people? Yeah. So if I can bring this account executive on board and have him or her understand the nuances that are so important to me that I know can derail a sale, let me teach you. The other thing that it does is it, one of my favorite axioms in life is that if I'm agreeing with you, you're going to think I'm pretty smart. You know, if, 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 if I share something and say, oh, wow, that's a great idea. You're right. Well, you must be pretty bright because you understood exactly what I said and we're now aligned. So it's a little bit of a political game, but build trust in each other by recognizing each person's perspective and then really uh, digging into it, coming to appreciate, especially for the AE, what the SE brings to the table. And then it, that leads to much easier uh, demo and discovery preparation. Go in prepared. Um, there is nothing worse than even if you have a capable AE Boy, you have to be doing it a long time to play it on the fly. Uh, yeah. You've got to know each other, you know, like like Butch and Sundance, if you're going to act like that, you know, 15 minutes to prepare uh, on both parties part yeah, becomes very, yeah. very important. Um, but yeah, again, it goes to me back to that basic human element of showing the respect for what the other person is doing and taking it upon yourself to own that you need to know something. Mm-hmm. You, need to, you need to be grounded in, uh, in what we do and how we do it. I hope that helps Jesse for I mean, yeah. lots of other things. Yeah. I mean, the, the prep thing is huge, uh, in, in my experience. And I think one of the things I'll also say that's worked well for me on the AE side for anyone listening out there, who's an AE or, or a solutions consultant is just having an open conversation and being, being comfortable giving each other feedback. Yes. Uh, because actually a few years ago, I had some pretty blunt feedback from a counterpart in the solution side of things. And, I hate to admit that I might have been bringing some donuts to to some of those cycles. I was maybe a little bit too quick to punt uh, the the conversation over to the tech guy, uh, and I got called out on that in a very you know professional way. Yeah. Someone said you need to do a little bit more to help you know contextualize the conversation because I think a really important thing is as the AE persona in the equation, it's not just about opening it and making intros, you've got to tell a story and the story needs to tie back into what your solutions counterpart is presenting. By the way, if you're going through a whole demo, this is something I used to be guilty of. So I, I can't believe I'm admitting this by the way, but I'm happy to share because I I want it to therapy all around. (laughs) I know. (laughs) I wanted to help someone out there who's maybe guilty of doing this right now. And I had a great 
great uh, sales leader who called me on this too. And again, in a very nice professional way, I was opening the call and then, you know, brought the donuts and then handing it off to my SC counterpart and letting them demo for 45 minutes. I wouldn't say a word. And then last five minutes, it was like, all right, let's talk about next steps. <laughs> and uh, a manager of mine, a great manager, uh, who's actually been on the podcast, by the way, uh, he, he was like, Hey, I was listening to some of your call recordings and just noticing that you didn't say anything for 45 minutes. What you didn't have any questions for them. You didn't want to know if this was valuable to them. You didn't want to know if there was uh, an opportunity to improve on their current situation. Nothing like that. You had none of those questions. And I, I got the, I got the memo pretty quickly. And within, you know, a couple of days, I was probably much more engaged in demos. Do not tune out. If you're in the AE seat, you've got to be involved. You got to be helping to continue to tell the story throughout the entire demo conversation. It, it's actually a real fine art. It's not something that's easy because it's very hard to interrupt someone who's in the middle of demoing a product. Yes. You have to find the right transition. You don't want to derail the, especially if there's a good riff going, right? If you've got good riffing going on between the, the buyer and the, the technical demo person, if that's going well, you, it's hard to interrupt, but you do also always want to like go into it thinking, let's back up and just, why is this important? Why is, should you care about this stuff? I mean, it sounds like you're liking these features, but let's talk about the big picture stuff too, here and there throughout the course of the demo. Yeah. And I will say, Jesse, that uh, I'm really glad you brought that up, especially back to your original point. Um, we're all getting on the road a little bit more. Um, when I am presenting, and again, this is a conversation that needs to happen. Uh, and people need to know and trust each other. If I'm presenting, I am expecting my counterpart to be reading the room, li listening and watching for things that I might miss because I'm wrapped up having to present the solution, doing a demo. Um, and so I'm looking for that value add so that, so that I am confident that we're hopefully not missing anything. And then to your point, how do you interrupt? Those can even be orchestrated. And again, if you yeah. trust each other enough, you can. So in the preparation, you could say, hey, when you reach this typical part of the demo, I'm going to interrupt and say, hey, would you mind showing blah, 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 like that's so fascinating that only I can yeah. do that. And then the, the SC says, oh, I'd love to show that. That's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up. It, it, you're on stage. Yeah. Yep. You're on stage. And so if you don't accept the performance art, you're going to fall flat and Let's and and you put yourself in the feet in the in the seat of and in the shoes of your buyer. Do you really want to sit there and listen to someone drone on? Even the best presenter in the world, bring another voice. If you're the AE reading yeah. the room, find a way to chime in because it breaks up <laughs> the, yeah. the tedium at times, right? Um, yeah. Keep it interesting, keep it sharp, keep it snappy. Trust each other, prepare for all of that, and really appreciate that you are on stage. Yeah. Have you found any really effective ways at Talru to coach your, you know, sort of selling pods, the, you know, solutions in, in seller to, to being able to have that kind of dynamic on those calls or being more performative sounds so weird to say, but being mm -hmm. better performers in a way. You know, it's, it is uh, interesting to think about because going back to the other point we were just saying is with so much of it on zoom, I think we've lost something. Yeah, you know, I actually I'm thinking a lot about that right now, Jesse, that I think about my counterparts, both, both my colleagues uh, on the CS team and we do wear that SE hat. I think about the account executives I work with who are very capable professionals, but it's hard to feel like you're on stage when you're a little box in a little window. Um, so I think we've lost some of that art, to tell you the truth. Um, it's something I want to I want to think about because bringing that stage craft to an inherently, you know, limited medium uh there's something we might be missing the boat on. Mm. Yeah. Barry, I want to ask some questions as we shift the conversation into more of the strategic role that you're in now. Uh, the company that I'm with, Hyros, we are starting to sell to partnerships of like agencies and mm -hmm. we're starting to do lunch and learns. And I would just mm -hmm. love to learn how you have leveraged your company's experience and how you help your partners, your agency partners to sell your mm -hmm. product to their clients and really building that relationship as like a partner channel type. Yeah. I'll tell you, Chase, it's an important conversation for us. I've learned a lot. Um, and, you know, very much to your point, 
a lunch and learn is a highly effective way to get everyone together, eat lunch, get a little overview of a product, uh, and it can work very effectively. My key advice is don't even think that it's one and done. Um, what we see over and over with the agency relationships is talk about people who matter. Um, often in any kind of agency, uh, it's that frontline account manager who wields so much influence. And you don't know them because there's 50 of them and they're all sort of running their own little business. Um, and then they turn over, right? So someone leaves and someone comes back and they, the person or someone starts and the new person came in a day after your lunch and learn. So now has no idea who you are. And it's another six months until you come back and do it again. Um, being creative to stay top of mind with agency partners is hard to overstate. It is remarkable to me when we either spend a day with an agency partner in their offices, which is harder and harder to do because they're not in the office, um, or going back to the dinners that I was alluding to earlier um, when uh, my CEO and I were on the road, we were among the customers we met were our agency customers and we took their executives to dinner. Um, and it's always amazing. You get back home and suddenly they have questions about new business that they want to bring you. You know, things that are happening, th where, where do the products align? And that, but the problem is that in the next two to six weeks, someone else is going to do the same. A competitor is going to do the same. So without being a nudge, how do you get to stay top of mind? It starts with the lunch and learns, getting on site, finding an excuse to send a gift. Um, we've used uh, thanks, T-H-N-K-S, T-H-N-K-S, uh, and there are other services out there. Little expressions of appreciation, a $5 Starbucks coupon um, cost, you know, gift card costs nothing. Um, we had a huge hit uh, at Christmas. Thanks to, uh, I told our CEO that he should be doing uh, consumer trend analysis because he seized on the Stanley craze right when it was starting. And oh, so, wow. yeah, we ordered Talru branded Stanleys. We got as many nice. as we could. And you want to talk about excitement from both our direct customers and our agency customers. Um, one agency partner said, oh, yeah, I love it because when I'm talking to all your competitors, I sip from my Stanley and they see your logo because you sent the best gift. You know? Oh, that's uh, good. Yeah. Okay. yeah and trying that's to find really something. That's really good. It, it, it was huge. And, but, you know, it's funny. We were very flattering the dinners that we were out at with our agency partners in like three occasions. Someone at the table said, oh, by the way, and they took out their, iP their iPod case. And it was the Talru logo iPod case that was all worn out because they carried these iPods with them everywhere they went. So, you know, everyone likes logo wear, everyone likes the tchotchkes, but finding something that folks really can use, it just helps keep you yeah. top of mind because being top oh, of mind good. is what so much of what it's about. You hear that? All the marketing folks, field marketing <laughs> folks that are listening, make them practical. Nobody wants a, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a bad example of, of something, but. Well, like, you know, you go to a church, the squishy balls and yeah. know, they're, they're cute. You bring them home to your kids. Yeah. We have enough mugs. No more mugs, <laughs> <laughs> like coffee mugs. But the Stanley's a great idea because those yeah. there was a lot of hype around Stanley. Yeah. I don't maybe there still is, but there's still oh Saturday Night Live yeah. just did a, just did a skit. Did the they? Dumb cup they called it. Um, you know, and, and yeah. not the, that we're on a, the the beverage theme, but we'd also we had done Ember mugs uh, to keep you know they they're uh, make, keep your drink hot. Oh, right? that's so cool. you know people like that they can keep their coffee hot all day. Um, and I don't know we might run out of liquid oriented <laughs> ideas for future <laughs> Christmas gifts, but we do try to always think what can people use? What, yeah. what, what would I like to receive that I actually could use and do it elegantly enough that I'm proud to, to use it in my everyday life. And who would you say is the key role at these agencies that gets the deals done? Is it the account manager that knows all the AEs that's bringing you all up in their demos or is it someone else? Is it the actual frontline AEs? The frontline people at an agency wield uh, a remarkable amount of informal authority. Yeah. Mm. Um, and it becomes really challenging to get to know them. So your reputation as a vendor to their management does become most important because uh, if you can stay connected to that leader who has five, 12 people underneath them, then they will influence the behavior of that frontline, uh, that frontline person. 
uh, because they know the bigger picture, right? Where are we getting our discounts from? Do we have any spiffs going? Is the, is the product high quality? We're proud to represent it. So that person can become your best friend, even while you try to, uh, meet and get to know as many of the frontliners as you can. And, and by way of example, not everyone got a Stanley, you know, they're mm. expensive. So we, we tried to choose the people who were most influential. Makes sense. Love that. Well, so as we're, we're kind of rounding out our, our time together, Barry, maybe, maybe you could share, I know you've now spent quite a bit of time in leadership roles. And one of the themes that I know you wanted to talk about on the show was some of the principles that you operate by as it relates to leadership. Uh, a lot of our listeners are actually not leaders yet. They're frontline sellers trying to do deals, uh, demos, those kind of things. But a lot of them have aspirations to lead companies, teams. Maybe you could share a few insights uh, on your leadership journey that might help some of those folks on theirs. Yeah, and certainly I appreciate the question. And I, I'd like to think that uh, your audience also thinks about when they are interviewing and looking at new opportunities, who are you going to go work for? Um, you know, probably the most offensive behavior that I see in fellow leaders is uh, taking credit when things go wrong and passing blame when things go bad. Um, it's exactly the opposite. When something goes well, all the credit has to go to the, to the person, the team that accomplished that. When something goes bad, as the leader, you have to own it. That ultimately, the buck has to stop with you. Um, yeah. One of the more challenging things I had to do actually back in the late nineties when I was, uh, asked to lead the North America, the North American team was my then boss asked me to write my own, write the email that he would send a- announcing my promotion to be VP of the solution. SET. No way. And it took me a whole afternoon and yeah. I fancy myself as a good writer, but I couldn't, say what I had done that was so wonderful. But the thing that I will take credit for is creating the environment in which these fabulous professionals could thrive. And when I really look back on that and I think about my own philosophy, you know, what did I try to do? First, you got to hire well, you got to train well and hope that you got the right people. And by the time you're training them, you see that they're in line with what you need them to do. Um, You need to fix hiring problems quickly. We're all going to make them as quickly as you can. Um, And then remove the political obstacles that are getting in the way of these people doing their jobs. Keep them out of the politics. Fight their battles on their behalf. Um, I had a funny moment when I did get that promotion. One of the first things that I did was, it was funny, on-premises hardware and software. My team used to carry laptops that were very, very powerful laptops back in the day because they had to run like a full server, you know, and show all the, the entire solution. And so one of the first things I did in my new role was I got the budget and I lobbied and got everyone new laptops. And it was funny how a few weeks or maybe a couple months later, sitting with one of the sales leaders, we were at a Yankee game. Um, and he turned to me and said, did you know that all the SEs got new laptops? And I said, what the hell do you think I do every day? <laughs> do, do, do you think that a, a fairy just delivered these laptops? You know, Do you know how much work went into doing yeah. that? And of finding the money and getting it deployed. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and it's that, that you know, oh, they got all new laptops. I, 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 how did that happen? I have no idea. <laughs> um, but, you know, that wasn't a political thing per se. But, you know, there were, there's always something that's going to come up that you have to pave the way for your team. You want them to grow and be professional and, and be able to handle conflict and solve their own problems. Um but eliminating political barriers and inefficiencies, I think, is what your responsibility is. And then when everything goes wonderfully, you step aside and they get the accolades. When things go wrong, you say, you're right. I screwed up. Let's fix that. Uh, yeah. Pretty, it's, I, have a, I have quite a simple philosophy when all is said and done. And I, I'll, I'll read books and things like that. And some great writers and some great, uh, you know, uh, some great speakers and TED Talks and things. Uh, but for me, it's, it, it generally is a very simple thing. I think simple is good. <laughs> well, Barry, as we come to a close, how can people connect with you and uh, just let us know your final thoughts? Yeah, this has been a pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you. It's, it's, I'm always flattered when anyone wants to listen to me blather on. Um, my mother would be proud um, that people might value my opinion. Um, 
I am on uh, LinkedIn. I th- I'm Barry Dash Klein Dash Five, but if you search on Barry Klein, uh, Vice President of Success at Talru, uh, that will be me. I'd love to hear from anybody, answer any questions, and just you know build uh, some new relationships. And then maybe give us like the the thirty second Talru pitch. That way, uh, if anyone out there listening is interested in what you guys are offering, uh, they can go look that up and, and get yeah. in touch with your team. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, as I've alluded to while we've been talking. Um, Talru provides a marketplace for employers and job seekers to come together. And our specialty is frontline workers. You know, it, that really came into focus during and after the pandemic. You know, uh, we've been using the phrase essential workers. Uh, the, the, the latest phrase on Wall Street and through the industry is frontline workers. Uh, but, you know, these are the folks who had to go to work every day while the rest of us could sit at home and work remotely. Um, yeah. And we really came into our own with warehouse workers and uh, hospitality, restaurants. You know, these were the people who had to go to work. We are very effective at helping to find them, uh, bringing job seekers together with employers for the uh, going beyond, if you think of a typical job board, uh, the what we do is very similar to what a job board does. The how is a little bit unique for us, which uh, is always fun to talk to customers and have them understand how we can uh, uncover unique audiences for them not just the folks who are browsing a given job board, but how can we help you uncover people who you otherwise would have missed? That's what we get very passionate about. Hmm. Well, all right. So we'll, uh, we'll make sure to put a link in the show notes to the homepage there, your LinkedIn profile, Barry, pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure. Thank you both. Thanks.